Tonight on KQED Newsroom, as 2021 wraps up, we look back at some of the big political stories that had us talking this year. Special guest engineer Amy Lowe tells us how she's helping to build the world's largest telescope and launch it into outer space. Plus a Chinatown you may not have known about, where showgirls danced while celebrities dined. And the year in photos is this week's edition of Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco, this Friday, December 17th, 2021. Hello and welcome to the show. This is KQED Newsroom and I'm Priya David Clemens. Typically, we start with a recap of the week's news, but we felt compelled this week to focus instead on the changing nature of the pandemic, which is top of mind for so many of us. California has returned to indoor masking as case rates from the Omicron variant rose sharply in recent weeks. We're joined now by UCSF Chair of Medicine, Dr. Bob Wachter. Dr. Wachter, thank you for joining us once again. Nice to see you, Priya. The first case of the Omicron variant was reported in California on December 1st. The CDC says it's far more contagious than other strains of the virus, with cases doubling every few days. So what's your prediction for the trajectory of this variant here in the Golden State? It is likely to go up very fast and uh, and very high. And I say that sadly. It's obviously not what any, what any of us wanted. Uh, up until a week or two ago, I thought that we had a uh, a little bit of per a little time that we wouldn't see a lot of it until January. But when you see the cases beginning to spike in places like New York and Miami, I think it's more likely that we're be going to begin uh, to begin seeing significant uh, spikes in cases even over the Christmas week. You know, there's a question about how much protection vaccination really confers. The LA Times reported yesterday they knew, the health department there, knew of 30 people in Los Angeles that have the Omicron variant. 24 of them were fully vaccinated and four of them had their booster shots. What does that tell you? Yeah, it's very clear that one of the superpowers of the this new variant is that it evades the immune system to some degree. And that means you need the highest possible level of immunity. So if you have had three shots, you've had you've had your booster, you are in the best possible shape. Uh, if you've had only two shots, which I no longer will call fully vaccinated because I don't think you are, uh, you're less well protected. If your only protection comes from a prior infection or you only had one shot, you're almost not protected at all. And we're gonna have to see, there's some early reports that maybe the level of illness from this variant is a little bit lower than that of the than that of Delta, but mm -hmm. not that much lower. The, the the reports from South Africa are maybe 30% less chance of hospitalization if you get Omicron than if you got Delta. But if we're going to see two, three, five times more cases, the math works out that the toll on our uh, society would be greater from Omicron than it was from Delta. So I'm quite scared about it. I think you need the most immunity that you can have, and that is from getting your boosters. And we're all fatigued by social distancing and wearing masks. Are you suggesting that we still continue to do that over the holiday season? Yeah, I think all of us quite naturally let our guard down a little bit because we're human and it's two years and we're sick of this thing. And, uh, and, and, and that wasn't a bad idea when the case rates were very low. But this is now a potential tsunami. I mean, this is going to hit us in a big way starting in the next week or two and peaking in January or February. And so and, and there's some early evidence from South Africa that it peaks after a couple of months and then starts at least stabilizing and maybe even coming down. So I do think we've got a tough couple of months ahead of us. All right, Dr. Bob Wachter with UCSF, thank you for your time. Thank you. California's political scene has been a wild ride this year. The biggest story was the recall election of Governor Gavin Newsom. While he remains in office, others are leaving the limelight, such as Congress member Jackie Speer, who announced her retirement last month. Joining us now to walk down the memory lane of 2021 politics in the Golden State are our KQED politics and government experts, Scott Schaefer and Marisa Lagos. Thank you both for joining me here Thanks in the studio. For us. Yeah. So, Marisa, let's start with you. The recall of Governor Newsom was the big story last year. He seems to be ending this year in a much stronger position than he started it. I think that's fair. I mean, last year at this time, everyone was mad at him, even if 
they still liked him politically, right? People were mad about lockdowns. They were mad about COVID. They might still be a little bit, especially on the right. But I think that him coming out of this recall, essentially with, you know, a point spread that looked exactly like the one he won at in 2018, the schism of Republicans among these all these candidates, including Larry Elder, who, of course, got not the best attention for some of his statements. I mean, I think Newsom really does come out of this looking strong, and I would be pretty surprised if anybody challenged him from the Democratic side from the left at this point. Okay, well, it's going to be an interesting one to watch again. Scott, let's round out some recalls because <laughs> Governor Newsom was not the only target. Yeah, it's like recall palooza. Uh, in <laughs> San Francisco, three school board members are facing a recall. That'll be on February 15th. Uh, a lot of Fam families, parents upset with them over their renaming, trying to rename schools at a time when the schools were closed and there are other issues as well. Uh, and then in June, the district attorney, Chesa Boudin, who hasn't even been there that long, is also facing a recall. And, you know, there is a bit of a through line, I think, uh, in some of these in, in that COVID uh, has put people in a, in a, in a mood, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly that was true with the governor and with the school board members. And then, of course, with Boudin, we have this uptick in crime that, you know, has really been top of mind for a lot of people. And there's even a recall up in Shasta County where a really conservative Trump Republican is facing a recall because of the COVID mandates mm. there in their county. That recall is being led by a militia member. That's how far to the right wow. they are up there. Yeah. OK, well, let's talk about a Californian who's been in the limelight nationally this year, Kamala Harris. So. She's been in as VP. It has not been the easiest start to this position. Marisa, what strikes you about her work this year? Well, we've talked about this before, Priya. I mean, I think Kamala Harris always is held to a higher standard to some extent than a lot of other people in her position. Um, she is the first of many things, first female vice president, first black and South Asian vice president. Um, and so there's been some criticism of her, but I also think a lot of what she's doing is more behind the scenes, right? She's been supposed to be working on voting rights legislation she has taken some international trips. I think by all accounts, she's been fine at the diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is some question marks about whether she should be more out front, whether she has power over that. Maybe Biden doesn't want her to be. Um, and just sort of where we go from here, given the challenges the Biden administration is facing more broadly in D.C. Um, with 22 coming up. You've mentioned about Kamala Harris in the past that there's still some runway there to not sort of count her out. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's that's fair at this point to say? I think so. I mean, she has, I think a lot of the criticisms we're seeing of her, of her staff, of her way she operates are similar to the ones we've seen in the past and she's been able to overcome those and win Senate office and VP. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that there's a kind of moment happening right now. Democrats are freaking out, to put it mildly, a little bit about next year and about 24. Um, and I, I, But I do think we need to kind of see how the next year plays out before saying what her prospects are beyond that. Okay. Well, you know, when she left office, she triggered some political moves, and we have some new players in state office. We've got Alex Padilla as a new senator taking Kamala Harris's seat, and we also have Rob Bonta as the new um, attorney general. Scott, can you tell us about the sort of policy changes they've enacted? Well, you know, the thing they have to do most is get known to voters. I mean, Padilla did run statewide, but Rob Bonta is really unknown outside of the Bay Area. In fact, in Oakland, it really is where he's from. And so what, they've, what they're focusing on now is just traveling the state, putting their name on legislation in Padilla's case and Bonta's case to a certain extent. And I think Padilla's done a really good job of keeping his name out there and really clearing the field. He's got endorsements now from every member of the California uh, delegation, Democrats at least, which means he's not going to have a real serious challenge uh, from a Democrat, which is really important for him. Rob Bonta's, you know, got some work to do, I would say especially with crime mm -hmm. being such a big issue. He's going to face some interesting uh, uh, challenges uh, come November from including the district attorney in up in Sacramento. So he, you know, is appearing today. He was with Newsom over in the East Bay talking about a new package of bills and um, funding uh, to crack down on crime and help local governments do that. So, you know, he, I think, has the tougher road between the two of them, but they've both done a pretty good job of getting their names out there. And can I just add, I mean, I do think one thing we did see Bonta kind of come in hard on that was a difference from his predecessor, Javier Becerra, another Democrat, is on police reform and oversight. He released data uh, data around both gun violence and some police stuff that his predecessor wouldn't. Um, and he's announced some investigations of police departments, including Vallejo. So I think that's an area where there is a slight change in policy. And we will continue to be talking about crime going into the new year, that's for sure. You know, let's let's turn a little bit and talk about fraud instead <laughs> of straight out Different violent kind of crime. crime. Right. <laughs> um, huge fraud at the employment development 
department this year with the EDD. Tens, uh, what, $11 billion that went out in fraudulent payment. Um, and we have saw hearings. There's been talk of reform. You all just spoke with the leader of that agency. Tell us about where that uh, situation stands as we close out the year, Marisa. Yeah, I mean, 11 billion is what we know. Uh, EDD says it could be between 20 and 30 billion dollars in fraudulent checks. I mean, there was some legislation passed uh, through the legislature that's taking effect, uh, aimed at sort of reforming the department. I think that we're also seeing criminal investigations about that fraud move forward, and we've seen some indictments. Um, Elaine Howell, the auditor who we spoke with this week, one thing she noted that I think is really important is how outdated their technology is, and I think that even with some of the reforms enacted by the legislature around staffing and procedures that were, you know, prompted in part by some of her audits, it's going to take a while to change this. This is an agency that's had challenges for a while. So I I can think this will continue to be a story in 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scott, we've got one last question here. Time for one more. Housing and homelessness. They've been on the minds of Californians, top of mind for many of us. What is happening with the housing initiatives that were passed this year? Do they have teeth? Well, um, we'll find out. The governor did sign a package of bills that uh, will make it easier for local governments and individuals to rezone, uh, to build, say, a duplex where now just a single family home is allowed uh, and near transit, up to 10 units of housing. The problem is it's voluntary, so it gives local officials the right to do it. The question is, will they? They really like their single family homes, and that's why we have such a huge deficit of housing in California, why the price is so high. And so um, I, I think housing advocates hope that it'll make a difference, it probably will, but okay. will it make enough? We'll see. All right. Scott Schaefer, Marisa Lagos, have a wonderful holiday, and we will see you right back here in the new year. Happy Thanks, New Year. Yeah. For two decades, thousands of people across 14 countries have been working to build a massive new telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will be the largest of its kind. It will be put into space to explore distant parts of the universe that formed almost 14 billion years ago. The web is set to launch December 22nd from the Guiana Space Center in Kourou, French Guiana near Brazil. Joining me now to discuss how the telescope was built and what it will look for is Northrop Gummins Deputy Space Vehicle Director, Amy Lowe. Hi, Amy. Hi, how are you? Great. It is so great to be talking with you. I'm excited about this launch. Some have described it as the Space Super Bowl, but instead of happening every year, there really hasn't been anything like this since the Hubble Space Telescope launched 30 years ago in 1990. So tell us what the James Webb Telescope is going to do. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the Webb Telescope, uh, it's primarily designed to look at the very first stars and very first galaxies that ever formed in the universe. So we like to uh, say that it is going to take the baby pictures of the universe. So tell us about looking at these baby pictures of the universe. Another phrase that I've heard is first light. What will this do for our understanding of science and our beginnings? Uh, yeah, so uh, previous missions have looked at uh, the universe when it was very, very beginning and very early times before there were stars and galaxies. And with capabilities, things like the Hubble telescope and uh, large telescopes on the ground, we're able to look fairly far back in time as well. But never have we taken actual pictures and data and, and information about the very first stars and very first galaxies that ever formed. And what that will tell us is how exactly they form, the circumstances under which they formed, and also the distribution of matter in the universe at that time. So we basically have a blank chunk in our understanding of the universe, and that's what we will be filling in with the Webb Telescope. Why does that matter? Why do we need to know this information? You know, uh, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and you know, I, I don't really know that I have a very good answer for that, but I'll respond by uh, asking, uh, why do we create anything? Why do we make art? Why do we look up at night? Why do we explore? I think there's an inane human drive to understand and to gain knowledge. And Webb will certainly do that, understand and gain knowledge. There's also another part uh, of, of doing something like Webb I think it fulfills within us the sense of wonder and of exploration. We want to know what's out there. And, you know, uh, what's more out there than the very first stars and very first galaxies? 
So you work for Northrop Grumman, and that's the industry lead on this project that's partnering with NASA. And I understand that you, as a team, have had to come up with sort of 10 new devices, 10 innovations in order to make this even happen. I mean, this is not something you can go and, and just get pieces off the shelf. This is something you are creating brand new, and the technology has not always existed um, prior to this. You're, you're making it as you go. Uh, well, so any kind of big endeavors where you're pushing the boundaries of engineering and science requires that you, you invent and you innovate. And uh, I think web is the culmination of that. My husband likes to say that uh, the web telescope is the most complex thing and the most uh, interesting, in his opinion, anyways, uh, that uh, human beings have ever built. Um, and I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but certainly it feels like it on some days. And so, of course, pulling together something this complex and this challenging is, is an enormous endeavor involving a lot of work and a lot of innovation. Absolutely. So there has been a lot of interest in space lately, especially as some of our billionaires have left Earth's orbit. Jeff Bezos recently, Richard Branson, um, and Elon Musk has sent up uh, rockets and maybe going himself at some point as well. What are your thoughts about these sort of billionaires in space? Um, you know, I don't really know much about billionaires, uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you that I would love to go too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, as soon as it's uh, widely available and, uh, you know, uh, kind of like uh, an airline trip, uh, uh, sign me up. I, I really want to go too. So when do you think that will happen as we start moving further into space exploration and as technology starts to advance so rapidly, when do you think that we as humans will be able to board a spaceship as easily as we board an airplane? Let's see, I'm 46, so um, I really, really, really hope that uh, I am able to make that trip in my lifetime while I'm still, you know, not too old and uh, can deal with the stresses of going into space. So I think I got about 20 years uh, it took, uh, uh, I think, uh, 20 to 30 years for air flight, plane flights to become common, um, or at least fairly common anyways. Uh, so my hope is that, you know, within the next, uh, call it 20 years, that uh, one can go to a ticket counter, buy a ticket, and uh, uh, take a trip out to space. That would be great. I would love to go. Well, I'm the same age, so, you know, maybe we'll be on that plane together. It's uh, a date. <laughs> Spaceship. I'm not used to saying that yet. Spaceship right? together. <laughs> So what do you think? Do you think we're going to find life outside of planet Earth? You know, I, I don't know, um, but I really hope so. I think that the Webb Telescope has uh, some good opportunities to look at atmospheres on planets, uh, if they exist. Uh, and uh, if we find uh, such a lucky planet that's maybe in what's called a habitable zone around a star, um, and if it has an atmosphere, uh, close enough to Earth, uh, you know, the Webb Telescope may be able to pick up some signatures from the atmosphere and uh, who knows what we'll find. I mean, I, I think personally that's one of the really exciting areas that we, uh, we're going to be looking forward to. All right, Amy, in the last few seconds we have here together, what are the obstacles that we need to overcome in order to keep going with future space exploration and research? I don't know that it's an obstacle, but uh, we need more scientists and engineers. And so I really hope that things like the excitement around the launch of Webb Telescope inspire the kids and the students and uh, make them become interested in science and in engineering and choose that as their career, push the boundaries of what we can do, innovate, and uh, make uh, the kind of science fiction uh, reality. I'm a big Star Trek fan, uh, TNG, sorry, uh, you old Trek folks. <laughs> um, and I really, really just want to make that a reality, make that our future. And that would just be so awesome. Amy Lowe, a lead engineer on the Webb Space Telescope program. We wish you all the best with your launch later this month. Thank you very much. San Francisco's Chinatown has long been a popular tourist destination, but back in the 1950s it had a very different look and feel from today, with daring performances at supper clubs entertaining celebrities like Frank Sinatra. Reporter Chloe Veltman takes us back to that time in this visit to the Showgirl Magic Museum. We used
used to have five busloads of Bray Line tours that comes to the nightclub. They call it a Chinatown by night tour. It goes through the Chinese Sky Room and then finishes up at Forbidden City. Chinatown's nightclub scene boomed between the 1930s and 1960s. A new museum in the heart of the neighborhood tells the stories of the local cabaret performers who drew in audiences from around the world. So, Cynthia, tell me, what made you start the Showgirl Magic Museum? I was a dancer uh, during the uh, 60s, and so it only made sense to me that I would try to bring back the history of Chinatown and retain the history of Chinatown, nightclubs and entertainment. And, uh, have all the memorabilia. This is me uh, here with uh, Jimmy Borges. Jimmy Borges was a very famous singer in Honolulu after he left the Chinatown nightclubs. And uh, I actually traveled with uh, Jimmy in the 1960s. Discrimination against Asian people was rampant, and there were especially few opportunities for women. The burgeoning nightclub scene promised some measure of financial independence, with a touch of glamour. And there was an ad in the paper that says, Chinese dancers wanted, no experience necessary, will train. I said, that's the one for me. Many performed at the clubs against the wishes of their families, who considered this career choice improper. Oh yes, I kept that secret for a long time. The onstage talent, staff and club owners were mostly Chinese, but the audiences and the band members who worked for unions that kept Asian musicians out were mostly white. The Asians that come, uh, they usually are the businessmen taking their client out for dinner or for drinks. The performers worked hard. They typically rehearsed during the day and did three shows a night. They also mingled with plenty of celebrities, like Frank Sinatra. That picture was taken after he filmed Pal Joey here in San Francisco. That's why the lady is a tramp. Sinatra rushed over to help me off the stage, uh, lit my cigarette and did a lot of small talk. He was a complete gentleman. The Chinese nightclubs eventually fell out of fashion. Late 60s, early 70s, Playboy clubs and also the topless bars came into play on Broadway. And I think it killed a lot of the business for the dinner theaters here in Chinatown. After chatting with former showgirls Pat Chin and Cynthia Yee, I was curious to find out how Chinatown's nightlife scene has evolved since the days when the likes of Frank Sinatra were head down to the Forbidden City or the Chinese Skyrim to chat up the local talent. Let's go inside here and meet a guy who knows all about what it's like to start up a nightclub for today's crowd. Hey Steve, I'm Chloe with KQED. It's great to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. Local entrepreneur Stephen Lee opened the Lion's Den Bar and Lounge in March of this year as a way to kickstart Chinatown's flagging nightlife. And that's why I wanted to open Lion's Den. It's to kind of have another way of trying to show that we can maybe help Chinatown a different way than just having a store selling back scratchers. Decades ago, a club with the same name existed in this very spot, only the entrance was on Grant Avenue rather than on Wentworth Place, where it is today. It was Lion's Den as a club, performance space, and upstairs was Gotwa, which was the restaurant. But running a nightclub today is different to what it was back in the 1950s. There are parking issues and car break-ins are on the rise. The recent spate of racially motivated attacks against the local Asian population have made some people fearful to go out at night. And then there's the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. They were starting to come out, but as soon as they announced that the Delta was coming, tables were, were canceling and bands were canceling, right? because we're requiring vaccine cards now. The showgirls and big bands of yesteryear are long gone, but at the Lion's Den, the glory days of Chinatown's nightclub scene are not forgotten. So tell me about this one here. So these are the club owners. Charlie Lo owned the Forbidden City, and Andy Wong owned the Chinese Sky Room. This side of the pictures are all the celebrities that came 
back in the 40s like, and the 50s. Like who? There's some great pictures well, here. Well, you know, Bob Hope. Uh-huh. And of course, uh, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren McCall, Bing Crosby. And Stephen Lee says remembering the glorious past of Chinatown's nightlife gives him hope for what lies ahead. And I think the future is going to be good after this whole pandemic thing is over. Because people love Chinatown and the new generation wants to support Chinatown. For KQED Newsroom, I'm Chloe Veltman in Chinatown. This will be our last in-studio show of the year, but before we let you go, tonight's Something Beautiful is a look back at the year in photos taken by our talented KQED staff photographer, Beth LaVerge. There have been difficult moments this year, as we all know, but many things to celebrate as well. Enjoy. And that's the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook, or you can email us at knr at kqed.org. And you can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. We will see you right back here in the new year on January 7th, 2022. Happy Holidays.